I think I, I, I would also support extending the length of the meetings, and if we don't add sort of additional meetings, say like two a month, I think, for raising the expectation about work that gets done between meetings by individual commissioners might sort of make up for not having at least you know two meetings a month. Yeah, but I, I think I would I would want to see that compromise. Okay. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. that it, along with raising the expectations, though, has to come some sort of spelling out of the agenda so you know what's expected. So it's, in other words, if, if we want to be productive, we not only need a meeting agenda, but we need, I think, a um, an outcome agenda. That we say, you know, for the next meeting, this is going to be the thing we're going to decide on. This is going to be the thing we're going to accomplish. Therefore, people need X, Y, and Z things done before they get here. Um, and figuring out a way to spell that out and have it be transparent to, uh, to everybody, I think would make make us more productive with the extra, whether it's an hour or a half hour. Um, that's, that's my thought. Any thoughts from anybody? And wouldn't that just be part of the minutes of, of the meeting, which would be the next setting up for the next? Yeah, but we're often doing agendas after the meeting, so it, it, it makes sense. We can just get the agendas out early and sort of talk about, figure out some way to divide this of where the comments are. But I mean, I would think that we would sort of leave a meeting with an understanding, yeah. individual understanding of what each person's going to do, and I think that sort of goes back to the proposal that a few of us had a couple of meetings ago where we kind of all take pieces of the climate action plan based on what our relative expertise is and we could be sort of working on building out recommendations and substance behind those topics between meetings yeah because we're so constrained by the open meetings law when we're here together is when we need to decide who does what individually because then we don't get to talk about it. <laughs> but there's no limit, just to be clear, in terms of assignments. So there's limits in terms of assignments of subgroups. But if we say, here's going to work on, and one or all of you want to work on that individually, you can sort of be brainstorming, doing research, and thinking about what you want. So, so that is something that limits the, it's the deliberation. Sure. Um, but I, I think when it comes down to, oh, well, you can work on this, you can do some yeah. brainstorming, as opposed to, it's kind of an assignment. We've we've kind of agreed. You're the expert, and we'd like your thoughts on this for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. That would certainly, if I if I were the person who had the assignment, that would help focus my mind. It just maybe just as a process, things mm -hmm. worth considering. So I'm going to ask Chris a question. I'm not really sure. This is only the second meeting I've been sharing, but so there's some things like the the climate action plan, which we know we know it's an agenda for the next few months. But I was surprised between the last meeting and this one how many emails I got from people saying. Can we put this on the agenda? Is that so? I wouldn't know that meeting before. Is that typical or is it that non-typical? Um, I think it's a new typical. <laughs> okay. Things have changed over the last couple of months. Okay. So those are things that wouldn't be able to warn you about, except by sending an email out and saying, "Here's a new thing we're talking about." My impression of what Ben suggesting is more uh, a homework assignment that would that could be uh, sent out to everybody and maybe this could be something that uh, so that Chris could handle or you could handle that we we discuss in the meeting what we're going to do maybe briefly uh, at the end in the private sector it's called your do outs and you have your do outs from a meeting and you're expected to deliver those by a certain time we could have a brief discussion on that at the end of meetings and then that could be written down by whoever's taking the minutes and then used as a base for Chris to send out to everyone just as a reminder of what we agreed that we would do. I would find that very helpful. And as Ben says, it sharpens our food, sharpen my focus. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, I'll say in the past, you know, historically, commissioners haven't really taken on homework. They haven't wanted to. They're Tons doing it change, now, yeah. so. <laughs> oh, <that's> yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, the caution I always want to have in terms of a, a homework piece is we are a deliberative body of everyone. You know, the more yeah. we break things down, the less it's the decision of the board and the more the person who takes it on. So I, I think knowing we're talking about so you can do research is great. How you know assign an individual person is what I want to be more cautious about that. I think that we could set it up so that 
what we what any individual member delivers is then deliberated upon as a body of yeah. public. Yeah. So that we're simply doing some base research that we can deliver uh, in good faith to the committee uh, and then uh, deliberate on it in public. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Could you just clarify open meeting law and how it relates to this? I know there was some discussion at the last meeting. Yeah. And I just wanted to uh, make sure I fully understand. So anything is okay, we just have to advertise it. So any subcommittee, whatever we call it, a group, a couple of friends meeting for a beer, who's charged with doing some deliberation on behalf of the committee to report back a report to the committee ends up being a subcommittee for which we have to post meetings, they have to be available in wheelchair accessible places, and we have to take them in the school um, So an individual, you know, and, and it could be, how many of us are, eight individuals all doing an assignment by themselves and reporting back, no problem whatsoever. But as soon as two of you get together, it's sort of a subcommittee. It really crosses a bad threshold when it gets to a majority of the committee. And, even, and the other caution is even a serial thing, so you and I talk together, and then I talk to Ben, and Ben talks to Gordon. Yeah. You know, you're building it up. But anything where you're doing any deliberation with somebody else becomes a subcommittee, again, open to public meeting law. And as soon as it, you meet the public meeting laws, you, we can do unlimited number of meetings. Right. But if two of us get together not charged by the committee just to do research together, is that so that's where you get the fine line. The, so, yeah. you know, you and Ben want to sit down over a beer or coffee, you know, and, and talk about something in your position that's not a problem at all. If it starts seeing like the committee is charging you with something, mm -hmm. then that's that's where the line becomes. Um, and it's not always clear. You know, we don't want to wink, wink, nod, nod, but you guys are going to be in the process. But it's not the number of people. It's not the number of people. I mean, you, you get in real trouble when it becomes a majority of the committee because then you're actually replacing the committee's discussions. But even two people is still a subcommittee. But again, it's not, you know, you have the right to talk. So the stricter rules, and you're, you're on legislative matters, the stricter rules for permit granting boards. Permit granting boards, even two people meeting about something is total legal because that's, that's judicial in function. Legislative matters, you're still allowed to have the informal conversations, but just not be charged. So Okay, so does it make, I'm sort of hearing, but I haven't heard from everyone, so correct me if I'm wrong, I'm hearing support for longer time, maybe not two meetings being more of a burden, maybe an hour being the outside. Does it make sense to start with half an hour and longer, and then sort of we can always reassess it from there? Does that work? Okay. So we do have a, a just to schedule the thing. So at least for me in this room, not we haven't signed up for this room, but generally half an hour earlier is certainly fine for me and usually fine for this room. Half an hour later, the zoning board comes in. You guys leave and you get kicked out promptly at 5.30 because the zoning board. The zoning board doesn't always have issues. Like tonight, they don't happen to be meeting. Um, and so we can coordinate. Sometimes the zoning board has minor things, in which case they can meet in my office. So there are times we could go later, but we couldn't guarantee it. If we did it, or, and the problem with earlier is, the earlier it is, the more we're excluding members of the public who, and, and maybe some of you, who have other conflicts. So, do we want to be at 3.30 knowing some of the crucial public the logistics are fine, or go late, later knowing that some meetings won't work because of schedule? Third option would be to put out some kind of a doodle poll and find out what day of the week and time, you know, what, what day of the week, four o'clock would work. Because maybe we don't meet on the same. Could, could I ask, ask how long out we're projecting that this is the new meeting time? This basically I'm just looking at my own ability to show up. Spring semester, I can show up early. As soon as it rolls around to fall semester at UMass, all of a sudden I won't be able to show up. Would the uh, day of the week change that bit? Yeah. Okay, so that actually kind of leads, leads, leads us to looking at perhaps a different day. To look even broader. So for, just for me at least, that would only be Tuesday. So Mondays and Wednesdays, I teach at UMass. Um, okay. So I could do Tuesdays or Thursdays if we switch. I don't know other meetings. Um, Tuesdays are bad. Tuesdays are bad. Okay. Well, that sounds like a doodle poll solution. <laughs> Right, it doesn't have, I don't know, like, 
we have the Committee on Disabilities meets on Tuesdays, but not right. every week, so I don't know. Is yours a standing Tuesday? It's a standing Tuesday, but, it, but I, if, if everyone else can do it, I can try to rearrange that. Okay. Thursdays, I'm totally flexible. I can come early and stay, or stay late. Okay, so let's do a doodle poll for Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4.30, both, at, 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 at do we meet? Yeah, 3.30 both days and going or four to six both days. I apologize for this late interjection, but um, I think that we would get a lot more done by extending the meeting by an hour than by extending it by half an hour. And I don't think that there is anything in our rules that would, that would not allow someone to leave half an hour early if they needed to for personal reasons. But if we shorten it to only a half hour extension, then we will have to come back and yet again make another motion if we feel like it's not uh, long enough. And it will be just, it will inhibit us from sticking around and getting some of that work done that we could have if we had really given ourselves that extra hour where we could, we could really talk through the details, which we're going to need to in order to move this complicated plan forward. If we extend it by an hour, people can leave early as long as we still have a quorum. Is that correct? Yeah, so, so a couple things. One is I'm certainly happy to leave to people what, what the consensus is. Um, yes, people can leave as long as we have a quorum. I have much more of a problem with that because I think having consistent membership, I mean, people, you know, doctors mm -hmm. come up, life comes up, but I think we should be scheduling when we think everybody could make it. Um, if we could, and, and the other thing is, just from experience, committees become less efficient the longer it gets. So at some point, and I don't, I'm not going to tell you exactly where that diminishing returns is, but at some point, we fill up the time or we aren't as efficient. Could we maybe just see a show of hands between the two before we move yeah, uh, forward? Could, could I make a different suggestion? We've yeah. got a, a data-based solution waiting for us, which is we do the doodle poll, and we see what people's actual availability is and we may find that there are actually no full two and a half hour block available so we could vote on it only one but we can't get it let's just see what the data say and 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 agree now we'll extend it if we possibly can that's right yeah so chris you want to do the digital uh, yeah totally okay yeah. okay anything else on the subject before we go on? all right so um what i'm trying to do is for the climate resiliency uh, process is just sort of spend a little bit of time each time that we build consensus and figure out where we're going rather than sort of getting stuck in the weeds. Um, so you saw this before, I mean, not the two of you were new. The rest of you saw this before. All I really did is I took this and tried to reflect on what people said at the last meeting. So this is, I think, what we had plus a little bit. Um, so let me just walk you through again part of the two new people and part of so you can see the changes. Um, the, the process itself, the steps, this hasn't changed, so you can sort of see the steps we, we go through. Um, the reason it's important is just knowing that there are lots of steps of which you're an important part, but not the only part, and in, in essence, the way almost any plan works, it's a consensus building operation. So we sort of assume most boards and most processes get a veto, but they don't get to impose their will on other people. So, that, that, so just be aware of all the steps. Um, the vision piece, uh, I simplified a little bit. People wanted this in the language on the left side in italics. People wanted this sort of a, the quick summary, the make them cry language. And we can sort of play with this, but so the italics on the left side is new. Um, and again, I play with the language a little bit, but otherwise it's more or less the same thing. The pathway to action. So these aren't goals or objectives. These are just sort of things we look at. As, basically, think of it as an outline for the report. And I did a couple things. First is, I just added a scope. For those of you who don't know, I don't want this to be inside baseball, but the, the, the way greenhouse gas emissions are done, and, I, and I'm stealing the language from greenhouse gas emissions, is scope one is greenhouse gas emissions that happen in your own community as a result of what your community does. So, you know, what's the greenhouse gas emissions leaving Northampton? And for the purposes of actions, it's what are the pathways to action for that? Scope two is Basically, you can, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but think about the electric grid, or to some extent the gas grid. When we when we pull electricity in Northampton, we may be required coal refired used to be in Holyoke or, or water to go over the dam in Quebec. 
So the greenhouse gas emissions may be somewhere else, 10 miles away or 1,000 miles away, but it's deliberately feeding the grid. And it's a direct or, you know, I turn on my power, I turn on my air conditioner, it's a direct correlation. So that's the scope two. Scope three is things that happen all over the world, right? So what is the figure of 15% of all green, I may not have to write, but 50% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. We have very little agriculture in Northampton. Our own agriculture is relatively small impact. But whether you eat meat or not, or whether you buy cheese imported from wherever or not, has a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions. You, know, you buy things from Amazon, it's mostly made in China, it gets covered here, it's a big greenhouse gas emissions. It's important because some communities skip scope three. Um, and I understand why. We have less control over those things. It's mostly an education and behavior piece. But I want you to know that because what the scope is has a lot to do with what we control. We have the most amount of control for city operations, scope one. The next amount of control what our community does. The next for scope two. And we have nothing other than education for scope three. Um, so you should be aware. So, so that column is new. Um, the, the rows are more or less what are before. I broke out a couple of things based on the conversations. So I didn't have history of emissions before. So think of this as gas leaks. This is sort of buried before in gas use, but it's a separate thing, you know, and it's important in this state because we've been pushing natural gas, which sounds like it has a slower carbon footprint. And we know there's been a lot of leakage from methane gas. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's, it's huge. So that one's new. And most of the other ones are definitional. It, um, at the last meeting, people asked me to add financing, asked me to add education and motivation. Um, and I forget exactly what the language was before, but the consumption of waste and agriculture, it was split a little bit differently. So it's not dramatically different than before, but that was the big discussion. Corey? Um, I just, I noticed that in that uh, scope numbering, you list uh, fugitive emissions as two and three. And uh, if I could maybe suggest adding one to that as well. Uh, we because have to, yep, because okay. we have an enormous number of gas leaks around the city uh, that if we were to take action as a, as a community to go out and find those and then hold the natural gas suppliers accountable, uh, it would be an action we could take right here yes. and, and would be significant. Yes, I agree. That's very good. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I'm going to run through quickly and we come back and spend all the time. The pathways to adopt, to, res, to resilience and adapt, adaptation. There was less discussion of this last time. Um, I added again at your request mobility and transportation. Um, I don't think I had anything else, but I may be forgetting some of the people said. I, refer, I took all your notes and put it in here, so nothing major difference. The cross cutting multiple pathways, I, I just spell out the language in the heading just so it's clear. This isn't supposed to be complete. These aren't actions, these are just the things that cut across categories. And I added again at your suggestions, regulatory systems uh, and behavior and education. Um, implementation didn't change at all. So that's sort of the background. You know, my goal is to get that before, we, those of you who weren't here before, we need to do a lot of massaging of the plan. I didn't want to touch the plan until we had a consensus on the organizing where we're trying to go for so um, I'm open to anything. Let's just do it again section by section. So any comments on the process? Part? Okay. Or any questions? Because some of this is maybe Greek to some people. I mean, we're still at four, correct? We're really at two. Oh. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. You know, it's not to say that some things won't be going in parallel. You know, we've already met with the planning board early in the process. We're going to brief the planning board at some point, probably before you're all done. So some things going on at the same time. I need to sit down and brief the mayor at some point. But yes, in terms of the major things, we're still. Wait, I'm just going to note, I'm not sure, uh, just on uh, the vision. Yep. One of them is kind of a task goal, eliminate North Hampton's community-wide contribution for the warming. And one of them is kind of a vision goal. Yeah, yeah, I can change the language. So I, I don't know, is one better than the other? Or should they mirror each other? I'm thinking the vision goal is almost is almost better. Yeah. You know, kind of the, the vision of the future where you want to be and just say that's what we're that's what we're gonna to get to. Even if it's unrealistic in many of our minds. <laughs> and again, this is the language the outline, so we yeah. can still massage the language later, but it's a good point. Whichever it is, you're right, they should be, be the same kind of system. Okay. Right. So any any process questions before the process? Yeah. Um, I would think that 
like step one or two would be setting like targets and having metrics for each of the departments. Reach your departments. Are we are we down in this? No. Oh no, I'm really in first process? blue. We're up here. Up here. Okay. You're an overachiever. I, yeah. <laughs> I thought this is where we left off last time. That's what I thought we were. Yeah, I just want to go back. So particularly two new members, but also go back and right. people reflected. So. So the dis the discussion having to do with the vision <laughs> last time had, did focus on the idea of, of dates and, yeah. and what we were measuring. And here I think scopes one, one, two, and three measurements would be how we would say, you know, by such and such a date, our scope one and two emissions will be zero, per se. Yeah, I mean, the issue with dates, I think it's two things. One is it's where the consensus falls apart, and so I'm trying to build consensus first. Right. And the other thing is I think as a practical matter, we don't have a lot of data, and I'm not even sure we're all using the same terms. Okay. So you know, this is why I want to talk about the scope a little bit. You know, So city operations versus community, there may be different dates for different things in the process. So I'm sort of trying to put that off and build okay, consensus. Okay, so that doesn't have to be in the vision. It doesn't have to be in the vision. It should be in the plan, but I just don't think we're there yet in terms of reaching it. Right. Chris? Yeah, isn't the vision often wouldn't include details like dates, you know, particularly if people do all sorts of things. There's no magic for doing it. Um, it tends to be, this is back to the consensus piece, it tends to be you go as far as you can and reach consensus. So if we all agreed, I mean, you know, in a, I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to revisit, relitigate after saying we're not going to relitigate it today, but in a lot of communities it's incredibly aggressive to say 2050, and so people put that in the vision because it's a it's a you can reach consensus you know it's aggressive we haven't been able to do that so yeah i, I mean, think that's like, get to. if you say we want to be neutral, <coughs> if, you know we want to be carbon neutral whatever no date assigned if you assign a date you go past the date where you fail you know, right you if, you, if you just say we want to be carbon <coughs> neutral as then possible. the next layer down is well, to set the date and stuff but yeah but we actually in the plan need to set dates i, I don't think any yeah. question about that no no i agree um, but, the, but the dates come further <coughs> yeah down. i think so we the, the vision stays as you know, this Great. thing that's always there for us to go for. Yeah, or we go back and we reach consensus and we go through different groups. <laughs> so if we can reach consensus, it should be, I would still put in the vision because it would crack, you know. Okay. I, mean, I will say I've done a lot of planning processes that some large percentage of people never make it beyond the vision. And so to extend it, you know, gets people's attention, that's great. But you have to build so, yeah. so just for, for my clarity of what we're working yeah. on right now, uh, what what you've put this together for is to help you with shaping that vision so that that vision reflects how we all feel as a community as best you can. Is that, is that what we're working right. on? Then we'll break each of these out in that plan creating process. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Other comments on the vision piece? Again, as this goes forward, we can revisit um, these things, but it creates now. I, yeah, I would like to suggest the addition of energy production being added to pathways to resilience and adaptation there's this energy interruptions uh, but energy production uh, in this town is going to become more and more of an issue as more people are installing solar and uh, and what <coughs> what we as a city have to say about that and what we allow uh, to be produced will have a very significant impact on our ability to achieve the goals that we're, we're striving towards for reaching okay. climate. Okay. Obviously, people can be producing hot water, but because most of what we're talking about is probably electric, I'm inclined to put it there. Electric energy supply and energy production. It would be, yeah, electric okay. production. Actually, elect, uh, energy production and storage. Okay. Both need to be yep. addressed in the visual. Okay. I guess I, I would suggest that that um, among the pathways forward that have more to do with the, um, uh, the the mitigation side in terms of accomplishing zero carbon is going to have to do with production of thermal energy and there are a variety of mm -hmm. ways of doing it and among those could could add to the resilience of communities that you know are that, you know there's one can imagine district energy systems yep. where essentially the microgrid includes thermal energy as well. So you said there's a separate pathway, energy production, thermal, 
Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about that, let's just not close off yeah. okay. thermal. That's all I'm saying. That's fine. Um, the, the purpose of so much of the energy that would be created would be to create ridiculous more in the winter. Yeah. So I absolutely agree. So that, that is the basic issue. Okay. Other comments in the pathways section? Chris. I wonder if we should add a um, section on um, uh, legislative lobbying. So what we can do here is we can lobby our state. Yeah. And particularly, I think, on the carbon price. Um, that's something I think, I don't know how else to put it in the plan, but I think it has to be. Okay. Legislative and administrative agency? Sure. Because it's also going to be you know, rulemaking stuff. Okay. Sure. Um, so I don't know exactly where this fits in, but I guess we're kind of spitballing through these things. It feels like it fits under financing because you have case financing. Yeah. But as I've done some of this thinking, um, I, a proposal that I'm, that I'm, I think I'm on the agenda for next time, and it's part of part of that is to propose a municipal utility, not for electricity, where community aggregation is a better way to accomplish that, but actually a municipal thermal utility. Okay. Obviously, not not a tiny thing to propose. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna actually I'm kind of bounce off that thing because I, I also had down, I, and it's been mentioned already a little bit. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of a geo micro district, basically geothermal districts mm -hmm. where more so people are, are pulling heat off a of, well, common geothermal system. Um, and it's been identified, um, folks in the audience, Willie actually is, you know, has mentioned it's a possible way for a utility to shift their um, business plan from delivering gas to delivering thermal energy. So, and, and my only question is, why a local could you make it like a local no, what, why it's ask them to or? please be nice and do this thing we want to do if we can have a water utility sure why can't we have a thermal utility we own the streets and I that's guess, where you're going to put the do we own the pipes yeah. we would if, we, if these were our pipes because we're not we interested in natural gas pipes right do we seize the infrastructure no do we own it no no, you think he's saying you could dish, you know, yeah. as streets get rebuilt. You're not going to release the natural gas pipes. You don't want to touch those natural gas pipes. Right. It wouldn't do us any harm. Ancient and they burn. And it wouldn't serve the purpose. Yeah. Right. Different pipes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the idea is just a utility. You have to be seeing which one is, you know, public or private utility, but just a utility, a, a geothermal utility of some kind. It just, it just seems to me mm -hmm. the, the way to finance things is to get beyond a lot of the um, the cost burdens on on private individuals, as opposed to the ability to um, take take on uh, low interest uh, loans, essentially at a utility scale, changes changes the cash flow approach to, to things and makes certain things possible that would otherwise not be. And at the municipal or utility time scale. It makes exactly. a lot, right? right. Yeah. Individuals will plan for five years, utilities will plan for 40 years, okay. governments should plan for 100 years. I, I think that right. this brings up a very important thing that we do need to put in here, which is the fi a financial aspect, which, which you had mentioned then. It's in all there, areas. Well, right, so the, there will need to be some way of assessing as a city, Fall into the planning, into the planning department. Uh, but the real accounting that needs to be done when you're doing planning uh, and looking at the various systems that are our options and figuring out one, what is the best return on the money that we're going to spend on it? Uh, two, are there uh, finance vehicles available to? Uh, get a loan to do the work so that we don't have to come up with the cash and that we can use the savings that are generated. Is there a way to do it? Uh, or just to make it as cheap as possible on an annual basis. Um, and then there, there could be something, I think, about working on creating new financing pathways with our local banks. So much of the problem with uh, solar systems is that people can't afford them and if we commit to start talking to our banks about how can we how can the banks help to fund an initiative to install all of these new systems that we want and be paid back on a monthly basis 
by their customers who would at the end own their systems, I think that what we'd be talking about is breaking the old utility mold. And I think that just trying to transition the utility companies from gas to something else leaves in place this empirical structure which is not serving the community in the best way possible necessarily. If we were able to make it so that people owned their own power generation systems after they paid them off and are not paying anything for power, we're doing something much more deeply democratizing with this revolution that we will experience over the next couple decades. And we need to think about how to deliver that freedom to our people. So I'm gonna put in, I'm gonna move, here's my suggestion, following that, to broadening it out. I'm gonna get rid of the pathways to action financing layer, move financing down to the darker green, which is cross-cutting pathways, because financing cuts across. And then I'm just gonna give examples. So there's been a lot of work done on micro bonds, so instead of having to pay ten ten thousand dollars a bond, you can spend you know thousand dollars. And so a bunch of things together put in that um, That way we're sort of not shoot is that local Local carbon funds, um, green bonds, there's a whole range of things. Um, uh, Palo Alto has done a lot of work, sort of the leader in the country in doing some of these areas, so we can go look at Palo Alto's work and plagiarize it. But I just want to be careful and not choose winners, but I don't know about this to say this approach is better than this approach, but we just list them all because there's an answer to some of this. Okay, uh, so I just had a quick question. So, are you saying so 3.0? How would that be? Um, how would that fit into what you're uh, proposing as a Are you saying I, would that be in conjunction with the community choice? I would say that in pathways to action, there could be something about uh, developing financial methods to help our help community members. Right. So that's separate from the whole. Uh, okay. Do you feel that that's in there somewhere? They're already out there. Yeah, I mean, you can, they, you know, we could, you know, make a more, um, you know, public knowledge, but zero interest solar loans have been out there for a long time. As, as you know, um, uh, yes. we call it um, air source loans. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, we don't need to develop financing, we can just use, use the mechanisms that are already in place. Right, a lot of them, I mean, using the micro bonds as an example, because something happens to treat me, it's out there in some communities, it's not something Northampton has done. So you're right, they're all mechanisms we'd steal from somebody else, but expand and scale them. Sure, and I, I agree with that. I think my larger point was that the decisions that we make as a city will have an impact on whether or not people pick up certain technologies. So we need to make sure that we're a, we're a, a force that is uh, as helpful for the people who live here as possible, and that we keep that in mind when we're deciding what to install and what to invest our money into as a city much as like what we would have done investing into natural gas infrastructure or other infrastructure. All right, so I'm inclined to just to simplify this, the, the last three in Pathways to Action from Mitigation, um, I'm gonna move them all to cross-cutting because they cut across everything and sort of spam them with lots of, of examples, and yeah. you guys can give me feedback next week. Yeah. Okay, other comments? I guess we're still in Pathways to Action Regeneration, anything else for there? I mean, it seems to me that we should be talking about moving towards zero waste in the in terms of our waste goals. I don't think that came up anywhere in the current plan and it started here, but yeah. that's pretty typical and yeah. every climate action plan we're doing here in Massachusetts. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's irrelevant. Um, um, I don't know how to fit this in. It probably fits under electric and energy, sup uh, energy supply, but just the idea to directly you know, put it in there to work with the utilities, whether, you know, very, I, I mean, electric utilities have to modernize the grid. I don't know exactly how we do that, but it's consciously put down that we will aim to work with the utilities. Okay. All right, let me move you down to Pathways to Resilience. And we have about six minutes left before Lily's moment in the sun.
Other path, and this is resilience seems to be it's less this committee's charge, but you're welcome to get involved. I mean, there's a lot of overlap, obviously. Yeah. Wait, it's actually part of the commission's um, next. Oh, is it? Yeah. We just never have really focused on it. Yeah. Okay. Good. It's been, it's been a minor one. And some of it, I think, is, is because it, it it's easier to to imagine metrics for the mitigations side, mm -hmm. right? We, you know, here's the yeah. thing, and then we reduce it by an amount that we can measure. And with resilience, I think our challenge is for each of these categories to figure out how do we know when we've achieved what we want. Can you compare it to projections? Projections of climate change and then you take a projected resilient response. Yeah. yeah. So so we, we could simply we could simply say we're we're gonna take a, a worst case scenario based on um, the I don't know the, the, the National Academies of Science um, right. projection which goes close enough to regional you know to regions that we can kind of pick our region. Say, okay here's the worst case scenario. How would we do how would we do? And Basically, scenario each through each, each of these categories and figure out where we're where we need to make change. That actually seems like pretty right. simple. Problem. And you can certainly say no more flooding damage with climate change than we had before flooding. We've always got some flooding damage. So it's some ways you could metricize yeah. that. Yeah. Well, and and then we we'd have a, a sense of what do we have to actually do yeah. <laughs> to avoid additional. Flooding. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's if I'm not mistaken, we're, we're looking most likely at periods of more widely varying weather, so we're going to have flooding in that drought. And actually, I think that this becomes most important when it comes to agricultural production. I'd love to hear, um, has Smith Folk done any uh, work on, on taking a look at what the expected impacts are of climate change on this specific region? No? I mean, that seems like if we were in the business of assigning tasks to people on this committee, that would be something where we maybe start to assign ourselves research for, for a category um, and, and think about it. Because you say agriculture, I say trees. Correct. The best yeah. way to lose your urban forest is to have them suffer a drought and you have a whole bunch of trees that, that just don't make it. Well, I think that really understanding what we're expecting to be looking at for this specific region. I think we all have some, probably have some pretty good broad brush strokes, but um, uh, to the best of my understanding, we're looking at uh, becoming a wetter region, but also having more prolonged droughts. Uh, and so the need to be storing water to then use for saving our critical uh, plants is, is going to be something that we're really going to have to think through. And the best projections, I mean, our, our consultant got the best projections we could. They were sort of basically yeah. downscale existing regional projections with lots of unknowns. But actually, um, since then, we've had better projections. Yeah, yeah not so. that much better, but yeah, yeah, you're right. Can you explain to me, so I, I'm, I'm um, can you just can you explain to me the difference between pathway to action and the pathway to resilience and adaptation? Yeah, pathway to action was specifically for um, regeneration and mitigation. Regeneration. I, I left that out. I should have that in there. So. Okay. And again, there's a lot of overlap. You know, if we have okay. more efficient buildings, they do better for heat spell and therefore draw less energy. So that they both okay. to the extent. May I ask, is, is light pollution kind of captured somewhere in here or not? It's, it's a bad environmental impact, but it's not necessarily really a greenhouse gas emissions yeah. impact other than the energy use going into it. Right. I it's think that that's a great that As a person who spent a lot of time in airplanes, I must say that like, <laughs> it, it, will, it makes a difference. I mean, it's crazy Dri driving over, or flying over a different city like, like Chicago is, is insanity when you fly over it. And I think that we would be an appropriate place to take action on that. And, and 
it, or at least to make a statement on how we feel. I mean, I, I think that light pollution is a, is a big deal, and it messes with the migratory species, and if we can give them something of a haven, then we should. Yeah, and you guys wear two hats. So this is the State Building Commission, which in a case like pollution is totally legitimate, right. but the plan we're dealing with is specifically climate adaptation. Yeah. Right. So after we do this and come back to sustainable right. Hampton, yes, that's cool. If you say you could tie it together, that's great. Right, that makes sense. Thank you. Also, but just a clarification that regeneration includes improving our environmental it, our environment. And so light pollution would So the follow. reason we chose the words resilience and regeneration is when it gets the sustainable Hampton plan, we want to use the same things in the same terms in a broader sense. So for this plan, it's really about climate, but yes, sustainable Hampton right. regeneration it, well, is absolutely right. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I just want to finish this up. Any last things on the cross cutting piece? Again, I'm expanding a section because all of it is clearly cross cut. But. Right, the implementation piece, I didn't really change this section. This is the, this, in some ways, we have to get further along in the plan. This is really more to give you examples of how we do it. So I, I'm a big believer, it's not, I want to be careful, it's not that any one of these things owns everything. It's there's always somebody else to put the agenda up to move it forward. So who owns that for responsibility? These are all going to be collaborative, between multiple boards and staff, et cetera. Chris, you? Yeah, not on this, but I'll let people comment on, I, I just wanted to make one last comment. Back to pathways before we before we leave the topic altogether. So, anybody on city implementation process, go speak to that first. Before we, before we well, Gordon said that, but I just want to make sure you get for the city capital improvements. The portion of what Gordon was talking about for financing for city operations, not for everything else, some of what Gordon's comments would fit under this capital improvement side. It's how does the city fund things, as opposed to having a private sector people. So, go ahead. Okay. So, um, oh, you, I'm just going to go back to your scope one, two, and three. Uh -huh. And scope one, um, you know, which is generally what we have control over here in the city, but that's the city as a whole, right? I'm actually wondering if there should be a scope one A and B. City operations versus yeah. comp. That's a good exactly. way to do it. Yeah. It's not the traditional way, so I guess it's not, right? We, but you're right. We generally don't go down to city operations. So yep. Should we get the city operations? Okay. I think it's particularly good, given this, again, I'm going to relitigate it now, but this conversation about what's the time period? So I think that's part of it. If people say we can be really aggressive in time, we can be much more aggressive at city operations, which are merely investments of money. I don't want to underestimate that's expensive, but at least it's within the city's control. The private sector, we just don't control. So, okay, I'll, I'll add it the next time. You know, obviously, some of these things, a lot of things are going to be 1A and 1B. Yeah, it's going to start running. Mm -hmm. All right, any, I want to move on to Lily, but any last two seconds before we go on? Hey, had you already made a note about like targets and? Yeah, we'll come back to that later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, to be fought over later. Oh, I'm not saying we'll fight over the numbers now, but as a as a general step, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, go way up to the vision piece. That that was sort of what the accountable. I added accountable. It wasn't there before, and so in some ways, that's the overcoming thing. Is we want to be accountable. We want to have targets in that process. So yes, we need to take that through to all the other steps. But that's part of it. So we don't want to just do feel good stuff. So the, the third entry in the vision table was accountable. So think of that as being targets, figure out how we get there. But yes, we should be carried through all the targets that we don't have. Questions? Um, the, this is maybe a bigger question about the executive versus legislative branch. But essentially, what I've heard and what I saw in, for example, the pesticide regulations was it shall be the policy of the legislative branch you know, saying this is a policy um, and then the executive branch follows that when they choose exactly how to follow it and they have full control over how the implementation um, so just thinking about as I see like okay there's certain things tasked here to executive certain things to city council where where is that line <laughs> so the line is not always clear right? policies can come just from the mayor without city council approving it. They can come from city council, any unit ordinance or policy. As a practical matter, the way I try to avoid that line is we try to get as much buy-in as possible. So for example, legally, the only board that has to approve this plan is the planning board. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean much. So it comes to you, it comes to staff, we talk to the mayor, it will go to city, we'll go to city council for endorsement. So what we try to do is avoid figuring that out. If everybody's on the same, 
place, then it doesn't really matter without legal blindness. Right. It only really matters if this disagreements. So does that, does that answer it a little bit? So, so can I make a proposal for how to move forward with this? I mean, because this yeah. is a great way of laying things out. And as we go down and we get into the details on each one of these, there should be a column for uh, required legislative action and required executive policy yeah. that we should be in a position of saying, y'all ought to do this, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so obviously to the legislators, we have a chance to actually just discuss it directly. Um, but you know, so for each, you know, so for instance, for accountability, well, until we're measuring stuff, it's hard to hold, yeah. hold us accountable. Does that mean that you know that we need a New York City type law which says buildings over a certain size have to report their energy use? Right. You know, you need all of a sudden to start right. that work. That makes sense. I mean, going back to you to both these points, yeah, so why it's not always clear is, you know, City Council and under our system can't start an appropriation, so the mayor submits a capital improvement to, to City Council, and City Council can vote it up or vote it down. So the, the the rules that go into capital improvements have to come from the mayor. But city council could not approve things if you think it's going to be devastating. You know, we decide to build a new school with no insulation. City council can vote it down uh, for doing it. And so they both have to agree to get there. I, does that make sense? And so yeah. I think I'm happy with the columns, but just know it's different ways. You get a city council who does nothing, and a mayor does these things. And the mayor does nothing. The city council does these things. It's most effective, obviously, when everybody wants to do it. Yeah. But we can add the columns, just knowing that it's sort of fungible. Just because I feel like it, we ought to have an output that's like a, here, here's a memo to the appropriate people who actually have power, because we don't have any, right? <laughs> like, here's, you know, here's a memo to you that's written down that says, here's what we think is a good idea for you to consider. Yep. And, and, and otherwise, we're just talking. No, I think you're absolutely right. We can play, when we actually get out of the format, and we can play one approach science at the end, because that's going to become really dense reading is to have a summary of all the recommendations and who, who those parties are, or mix it throughout. I'm not sure, it doesn't really matter to me, but we can, we don't have to decide that, but somehow more can that make sense. Okay, I wanna end us on time, so Lily, if you're- okay. Yeah, I think I'll just stay right here, if that's okay. That means audience members can actually see all of you, which is really a perk by moving that thing over. So um, thanks for, for putting me on the agenda. I wish Rich could have been here, but he had a, um, a training today. So he uh, you know, left me to do the whole thing. And um, I, I wanna give you an overview of the genesis of the Northampton's Urban Forestry Program um, and also the value of urban forests in general as they relate to energy and sustainability. And I know some of you know a lot about this around the table, so um, indulge me um, in a um, refresher and um, and then also you know this is the sort of thing that um, the sort of presentation I'm about to give um, and hopefully the inf the information it'll pro provide for the plan is a model by which you all can take notes um, borrow um, when you are doing your homework and then bringing it back to the Commission for consideration um, so here we go. So, um, you know, seven years ago, Northampton had no urban forestry pro program. It, it had no budget. It had a, um, a tree commission that was defunct. It had um, citizens who were frustrated at seeing a shrinking canopy, and it was documented that it was a shrinking canopy. This is a photograph of myself and another citizen com uh, tree advocate walking down a street, pointing to a tree belt that we had raised money to plant trees on, but the city didn't uh, allow us to plant trees. So we didn't. And they were just planted last year, um, Orchard Street, I'm very pleased to say, in a vibrant community um, planting day. And then um, that tree that um, an old man is standing next to, that's Ed Cotton. He was a 50 year, old, 50 year long um, arborist in Northampton. And he took it upon himself to take care of a few of the choice elm trees. A lot of them were lost over the years to Dutch elm disease. The city is now injecting um, fungicide every other year into um, the last remaining of our, of our elm trees. So th this is good news. So, so 2013 and this year, 2020, we now have a vibrant tree program with 100 plus volunteers. They're holding up awards given to us by the International Society of Arbor, uh, Arbor Culturalists. 
Um, and, uh, and it was a, an award that went to the Tree Warden, um, the Public Shade Tree Commission, and Tree Northampton, the citizen arm that does so many tree, tree plantings. And this is a feature that was written about us in ISA, International Society of Arboriculturalists, um, focusing on our um, vibrant tree program. So I can't go into the genesis of how that happened, but, but I will say in a nutshell, um, harnessing citizen engagement was, was the key to turning that switch. Um, I wanted to give you just a few uh, photographs of Northampton 100 years ago and today. So this is Elm Street, and you can see St. Mary's Church just at the back in the same picture today. Mm. Um, and this is looking down from Smith College onto Main Street. You can see the Academy of Music on the right. What um, used to be the old Edwards Church is um, you know, now a, a more modern building. Um, trees lining the street, the street not even paved, trolley cars, and the same street today. Um, by the same token, we've had some growth over the last hundred years. This is um, Forbes Library when it was first built, and those were the um, and the beautiful majestic pin oak trees that for a hundred years uh, lined Forbes Library. Unfortunately, when uh, Route 66 was expanded, um, those tree decl trees declined within 10 years because their critical root zone was um, impacted. So that's them coming down. We were holding a tree uh, hearing. Um, so our tree program consists of our tree warden, Rich Parsoliti. He, uh, the mayor has established a new department uh, forestry, uh, forestry Parks and Cemetery that he oversees. It's not a department, I should say. A division within the Department of Public Works. And he was awarded, awarded Tree Warden of the Year in 2019 um, by the Massachusetts Tree Wardens and Foresters Association. Um, there's a tree crew under his care, and they do both tree plantings and tree removals. They have um, very good equipment, and they're well-resourced thanks to um, the mayor and city council who believe in this program. And then there's a, the seven person uh, citizen tree commission. Um, I chaired it for the last five years and um, Rich is ex officio, not non-voting. We meet twice a month, um, which is rare for uh, a city commission, but I think it's part of the reason why we've gotten so much done because we build momentum. And we, um, we always start each meeting with a report from the chair and from the tree warden um, on, on the work we've done or the events that have come up, incidences. And then we always end each meeting with a go around where every person in the room identifies what their work, what their tasks are for that week or for the, those next two weeks. Um, the mission is broad. It's not just public shade trees, although that is um, our title. So I do want to clarify that, that our mission is actually to advise and assist the tree warden and mayor in researching and developing plans, programs, and policies for achieving a tree canopy that supports Northampton's goals of public health, beautification, economic and environmental sustainability, and resilience in the face of climate change, which is why we took such active interest in the climate plan. Um, so Northampton has not followed what its tree canopy has, um, has done over the years, as far as I know. Um, and, and so we did a, a recent snapshot uh, where we identified that Northampton is 64% uh, canopy by trees, which as the entire city is not bad, but of course that represents really the Western part of the, um, of the city that is, um, thanks to the good works of the planning department, largely preserved. Um, there, you know, there's private um, landholders too, but there's a lot of permanently preserved land there. And that is wonderful. It's a, it's a critical ecological corridor. When you get further into town, um, however, you have a major drop off. Um, downtown Florence is about 36% covered. Downtown Northampton, from a half mile out is 29%. Um, it within a quarter mile of, of City Hall is only 27%. All of the research will tell you that a 40% tree canopy is the goal that any urban area should try to achieve. Um, the best um, uh, benefits of having a tree canopy kick in at 40% and above. It's not like a magic switch goes on. But if you want to see the, uh, the real uh, effects that trees can provide in terms of cooling, um, propensity of people to walk and choose their bicycles, 
um, a 40% canopy is um, really critical, which is why a, one of the comments we made about the plan was we want to see a goal of Northampton having a 40% downtown canopy. Um, so when we first um, came together as a commission uh, five years ago, uh, we commissioned a, um, an inventory, a professionally led tree inventory of our public shade trees only. We identified about 11,000 public shade trees and about 2,000 spots where trees could be planted, public shade trees could be planted. So we're working on planting those. And just this fall, we planted our thousandth tree. So we're partly there, but trees are coming down all the time. Um, ben mentioned that drought is one of the best ways to kill trees. The drought of 2017 was devastating on our tree canopy. Um, it killed so many of our last remaining champion elms. It was so heartbreaking, but it also stressed a lot of our other trees and it didn't show up for sometimes two and three years after. We're seeing that now and we're, we're just removing tremendous amount of, of um, trees and carbon storage. So um, one of the best things to come out of the tree inventory was this online database called My Tree Keeper. You can go on to it. I put the link up there. It's on the city website. And you can look at, um, you can, you know, go to your zoom in on your street and look at all the shade trees and then learn about them. This one, <laughs> for any particular tree, it gives you a breakdown of the tree benefits. And so as you see, this covers the entire city. So it tells you um, that there are, you know, 9,008, I can't even read this, it's too small for me, but almost 10,000 trees. They have a value, a total value of over a million dollars. They provide, you know, here are the greenhouse gas benefits, here are the water benefits, here are the energy benefits, here are the air quality benefits. I would say that speaking to some experts, like our, um, our resident expert, Bob Leverett, who um, I hope you all will meet someday. I'd love to bring him in to introduce you to him. He's a phenomenal individual who's been studying champion trees his whole life. And um, he and Lori Sanders, also another um, just champion in our community, would argue that the benefits are way understated in these sort of mega analyses. Um, and especially, well, all of them. When you talk about the replacement value of a given champion tree, they might only say that it's worth a couple thousand dollars. And we know that they can have, um, that to grow another tree commensurate to that tree would, um, it, it's basically invaluable, it's basically priceless. Uh, so what we're doing on the Tree Commission um, is that we are creating a five to 10 year planting plan. We've identified our priority zones where we want to plant. And, um, and so this is just, this is a working document. You can see on the left column, here's are some of the areas where we wanna prioritize. Main arteries through town, city parking lots, proximity to low income neighborhoods, downtowns, congested secondary streets, uh, neighborhoods with sparse tree cover, businesses with possible good sites, proximity to bus stops, proximity to walk, uh, walking routes to school, proximity to important community centers. And so then we populate all of those, um, uh, the third column, the right column, with very specific streets that we're targeting. And we turn that into a five-year plan. This is obviously something you can't even see, <laughs> but this is our working document for the, for the next five years. And um, you know, within this, we have, uh, we have those priority streets, but then we've already also decided that we're gonna break down a given year of about 300 plantings into some other categories. Big Arbor Day planting, where we always plant a communi around community centers this neighborhood planting project where we encourage neighborhoods to, to self-organize, submit a proposal, and then have a massive planting day with a big potluck at the end. Um, and then um, we, we also are very carefully tracking um, plantings by ward, so we make sure that we're um, being as equitable as possible uh, in our plantings. Uh, these are some of the partnerships that we have uh, established over the years. There's Tree Northampton, which is a nonprofit citizen group that, that's main mission is to plant trees and support the city's tree planting mission. And that's when um, three weeks after those big trees were taken down at Forbes Library, they were there ready to plant new trees. Um, we also uh, have uh, collaborated with Smith College in doing this uh, 
tree had a tree based botanical labeling called tree speak which is very cool you use your your um, iPhone to uh, access the QR code and learn about a given tree we've now done that with about 13 trees um, we've collaborated with Broadbrook planted um, American chestnut trees uh, like disease resistant ones uh, on their site we've also done it at Bridge Street Cemetery my daughter took um, a big role in that and um, and then we this fall had the great tree bicycle tour I know Alex was on it, it was a phenomenal event that involved 150 people and showcased uh, 13 just specimen trees that should you know be absolutely treasured and um, pampered because they're so beautiful. Um, some priority areas that we are working on: one is strengthening ordinances and zoning regulations pertaining to tree canopy growth and protection. Specifically, working now on strengthening our existing significant tree ordinance. The tree ordinance um, protects private trees over a larger size when the permitting process kicks in, and they would be impacted in the permitting process. Um, I won't go into the details about that, except to say that once again we're very fond of spreadsheets and um, we look to first the, the first thing we do in researching how to improve our current ordinances is to, is to see what other communities are doing around the state around the country and around the world so this is being populated with data regarding um, ordinances in, the, in Cambridge, Arlington, Newton, Concord, Seattle, Portland, and then as far afield as Toronto. Another priority we have is to engage with planning at the earliest possible stage. There is a, um, a redesign happening of Main Street. We want to be very engaged in that and we um, have, it's no news to Wayne that we ask to be brought to the planning table at the earliest possible stage. Um, I think it had you know that may have averted some of the omission in the cli current climate plan of urban forestry. If we had been brought in um, earlier, we would we would have had a lot to say about the role of urban forest. But thankfully, it's not too late. Um, and I don't know if you all know, but this January thirteenth, there's going to be a um, a public design. Was it a charrette? workshop workshop on, yeah. on um, Main Street redesigning Main Street um, Imagine Main yes thank you we <laughs> we spend a lot of time uh, interviewing and learning from experts in other communities and then and then trying to provide the same in exchange so this um, these two YouTube clips on the left are from this amazing expert named Bob Ackley who has spent 45 years tracking gas leaks around the Commonwealth and he actually became a whistleblower. He worked for the utility and he became a whistleblower because he saw the devastating impact that ubiquitous gas leaks have on trees. And, um, and so he helped uh, a number of municipalities bring suits against um, their utility company. So he came out here to Northampton I did a drive through with him. We identified well over a dozen leaks that hadn't been previously identified and identified and documented by the gas company in a very small neighborhood, including a, a grade one leak, which is at risk of imminent explosion. So um, all this to say that gas leaks are a very, very significant um, problem in our community and specifically they impact trees negatively. We did find one within the critical zone of a brand new tree we planted. And that's just throwing away good money. Um, and then I'll, on the right there, I, pr I gave a tree steward training on um, the genesis of the, our urban forestry program to a bunch of folks who came to a DCR training. It was great, they, they loved the experience. Um, we got a lot of lessons from the town of Worcester. I don't know if I may be able to play this. I don't think I am. But anyway, my daughter did a 30 second um, educational video on um, the, uh, the energy studies in the city of Worcester after the um, decimation of basically their entire tree canopy in order to contain the Asian longhorn beetle, which was an invasive species that was at risk of spreading across the US and could have affected millions if not billions of trees. 
So anyway, what they found, no surprise, is when they cut down um, so many trees in Worcester, um, summer energy uh, consumption went up by, on average, 37%. In particular neighborhoods, as much as doubled. And Ben, Ben was one of the researchers of the project, so I, I uh, you know, I defer to him for any questions about that. But it was very illuminating. Rarely do you get such a longitudinal study that gives you absolutely incontrovertible data that um, shade trees reduce energy consumption. Well, I'm just watching time. Are you, okay. Can you be done within a minute? Uh, yes, I can be done within a minute. I'm very close. Um, so uh, some other, uh, there's such interesting policy uh, opportunities driven by um, scientific research. Bottom line in um, one study was that 40% canopy cover is the threshold for urban settings. Um, and that individual trees, not just whole canopies, but individual trees can play a huge role in carbon storage and sequestration. This is Bob Leverett measuring um, one of our champion trees. And he found that this tree alone, um, only by its carbon storage, offset the emissions of a, about a, a fifth of one American. That <coughs> says nothing of the um, shade that it's providing on that little tree. Um, there's some really, um, I think, valuable modeling that we can learn from cities like Cambridge on how to redesign our streets so that we accommodate trees and shrink streets. And I'll just end by saying that um, what our goal is, is to design for, protect, and invest in shade trees as an integral, uh, as integral to a resilient and walkable city. This is Barcelona. Huh? All right, thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any questions? I mean, I, I want to say um, that it, it, very, very impressive because this is going to sound like a the one spot you got to poke at. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Really impressive. Did you look at how the, how it meshes with um, with solar electric panels? I mean, that's something we think about a lot. And I'm not going to be able to answer that really um, simply. Um, but, uh, and, and actually I think, Ben, you have some interesting um, research on at least the importance of trees during peak uses. What do you pay attention? Yeah. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to just speak I, to I, I mean, ba basically, shade trees, and particularly the evapotranspiration characteristic that they do to a general area when you get to these higher canopy levels, reduce and shift to earlier in the, the day the peak loads from air conditioning. And so the benefit of photovoltaics, which actually provide their peak at a time when the demand too early for the time. So if, if your your air conditioning peak is at 6 p.m. and your solar peak is at noon, they're out of whack the shade trees move the air conditioning peak closer to noon. So PV somewhere else is doing better, is, is, is being better matched by the load when you actually have shade trees in the neighborhood. Okay, so there's a way to actually kind of blend and use the two cooperatively. I mean, they're blended on, on my particular property, and we, um, Rich always uh, advises people who are thinking about cutting down a shade tree for solar panels to first of all, just go to the tree benefits calculator to consider what are the benefits of that tree. And then also ask themselves, have they considered that the, the, that tree is shading them? I mean, as we move from a predominantly heating to a predominantly cooling region, which we are going to do over 50 years, it's not immediate, but it's over 50 years, those, you know, those tr trees will be more and more important over your house. Yeah, yeah I didn't mean to make up. A competition between yeah. them. Yeah, but, but, but you know, if you ask any arborist, more than half of their work these days is removing trees for solar. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. But, uh, I just have, I, uh, one thing popped into my mind. I wonder um, if you guys consider uh, yes. the end use of the trees that are coming down. You said that so many trees are coming down right now, and. Uh, the carbon sequestration at that point either can be made or broken if that 
tree is turned into lumber and put inside of a building or turned into a chair, then that carbon is not It's really so hard. I, I, I mean, you try it sometime. <laughs> it's so hard to, to cost effectively get nice straight boards out of shade trees, for, you know, that are near houses yeah no i mean like if yeah. no i mean like when these trees are already coming down yeah I mean, looking at what they're doing with the trees you know what there's a great question for a bridge i don't know the answer to that in terms of public shade trees when the city takes down public shade trees i don't know the answer to that i mean we talked about 10 minutes last time we went to the last side of my head so um this is is related to trees though in a different way so you know we had this whole debate about you know what are our, our what can we be carbon neutral and, and a key part of being carbon neutral is going to be carbon sequestration. So I just want to talk about a project the city is doing and sort of give people any chance of input if you want in this process right now. So where some of you probably know we're buying the old Pine Grove golf course. Um, we should be we expect to close in middle of February. Um, so they go before the planning board, they're carving off five building lots. Assuming the planning board approves the five building lots, those five lots are a total of six acres, seven acres and the 105 acres comes to the city. We're having a forester do an assessment now, so these aren't exact numbers, but of the 105 acres, we're getting something like 25 acres is forested, again, it's not an exact number. Um, the rest is open. It's our plan to keep about 10 acres, five to 10 acres of the land for farmland, um, and the rest we want to reforest. Um, and, so, and, and so this becomes a major you know, carbon sequestration project. We're sort of, as an exercise, trying to figure out, you know, if you were selling them the carbon, the, the carbon credits on the California Offset Exchange, what would that be worth? It's not that we're planning to do this. It's sort of similar to, to Lily's exercise and saying, here's what it's worth. It's not what we're going to sell them at all, but it's sort of, you know, Chris is fond of saying, if you put solar on your roof and then you sell your racks, you really shouldn't be claiming credit because somebody else is claiming credit for your solar. It's the same sort of thing. We're, we're not going to sell the carbon credits, we're going to keep it. But we're trying to figure out financially what's that worth to us and from a carbon footprint what's that worth to us and then we're trying to model this out over the next hundred years and obviously modeling out becomes you know, how many of those trees are going to die and what, what what infestations are going to be here it's really more an exercise but so there's two parts just to think of one is this site already we know what we're doing um and we're, we're doing a big so golf courses are even though they look nice and green <laughs> are pretty close to parking lot pavement Right, so a lot of water hits the ground and runs off. The water that doesn't hit the ground sinks into the ground and then goes to under drains and runs off. So we're gonna be digging up every single catch basin, every single manhole in the entire property this spring and backfilling those uh, with soil. We, we can't clear out all the pipes, but at least the pipes won't go anywhere. Um, we're gonna do a lot of tree planting. I mean, our current budget is some of the neighbors, $50,000, $100,000 of tree planting or scarification so that we can actually plant. We're still trying to figure that out. Um, we're not gonna plant what was historically filled wetlands because we may someday wanna restore that wetlands. And wetlands themselves are actually really good for carbon sequestration, you know, organic soil as opposed to sand and clay or whatever it is now. Um, so it's gonna be off, we'll be filling, we'll be planting trees from the edges and then not in the middle where we need to get a lot more, more money for so we have about a three hundred thousand dollar budget for the project um, that we'll be doing between now and, and so we're buying land in the middle of February, investing about three hundred thousand dollars in restoring the site, and it's going to be in, and there's lots of areas that are going to be a challenge. So new trees at that scale are great deer grazing grounds, and so you know what can we do without just feeding the deer and spending lots of money? It's not the same as street trees in that sense, um, and and frankly, discussion about herbicides. This kind can, you know, how can we really manage 50 acres of trees without doing any treatment whatsoever? Um, so it becomes a learning curve, but it also, the, the, so there's some things about a specific site you may want to weigh in on, but it also sets up broader discussions of how we manage our property. So I'll just give you one of the properties, I'm going to stop. We bought a Pine Barrens, this is, those of you who've been to the, the Leverett Pine Barrens, or, or been to southern New Jersey, have seen Pine Barrens. Pine Barrens are naturally very, poor soil uh, and naturally a fire ecology. We bought a, a hundred acre pine barrens. In the normal course of things, if we were having this conversation 30 years ago, we would reach out to UMass fire ecology. We would cut down the trees that are there. We would scarify the soil, get rid of the organic material, and we would set a fire 
and we would restore it to the way this has been managed for thousands of years. On the other hand, we could say we're going to give up a pine barrens. So we're going to change an ecological group, which is not our normal practice. We like restoring ecological things and saying we want a dense forest, we want organic material, we want, and it's not the right answer. So you don't have to weigh in, but it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate debate. Fish and wildlife would love us to manage it as a pine barrens. I have very mixed feelings. I don't even have a opinion. I have lots of opinions, but I go back and forth daily, so I'm not lobbying for anything. Um, but I think it's a broader conversation to think about as we manage other conservation. You know, and even our conservation areas themselves, we have never cut a, for a conservation area for timber purposes, for income. We have cut conservation areas for uh, to deal with disease trees, to deal with those kinds of things. But should we be thinking about a different management practice for, for what we do? So, but I mean, I, that's what I have. I'm sure there's any discussions or thoughts that anybody has. So your first question was, what would the cost of carbon be? Yeah, I mentioned mathematically. How much carbon we get and how much we, could it go on the carbon exchange? But we have to do modeling for that. You know, what would we expect those trees to grow to and how much, what percent we're down to? Have we considered, okay, so the, this has come up in previous conversations, uh, the idea that we need to generate power here. And uh, have we considered examining the difference in carbon sequestration versus the carbon offset of installing PV panels in land that's already cleared, you know, and not being used for agricultural purposes and ready to produce power and it would be at no loss to the community. And we wouldn't have to then give up existing agricultural land, forest land, uh, other use land in exchange for siting of uh, renewable power. Yeah, yeah. No, it's absolutely part of the assessment that, that we do. Is yeah. We decided this wasn't the right piece um, sure. because of soils, because of wetlands, because of significant damage to Mass Audubon Sanctuary below. They, they basically got rid of the floodplain when they built this. Mm -hmm. And so the water floods down quickly, creates a threat to Route 10 or to Route 5. So yes, sure. you're, you're absolutely yeah. right, but we okay. did that in this case. We didn't Wonderful. do it as a quantified piece, but yeah. Great. Did, will you go further? Um, carbon credit and value? I just didn't quite understand what your question, if you had an actual question to Yeah, ask. well, okay. how much, so one is how do we quantify? You know, how much, car, if what we're saying is we want to be carbon neutral, whatever the time period is, mm -hmm. and we can't necessarily do that completely by ending use of carbon, particularly if we do a scope through it, right? People are going to still order from Amazon, people are still going to drive in interstate through town, the things we don't control. So how internally do we count this to exactly. our like, offsets? Right, right. Do we want to use the California rules because they're furthest along? I don't know what Europe's doing, frankly, so I'm sure there's other people who are further along. Well, there's a new, a new method that just came out. Inkley just put out a new method for accounting for the carbon impacts of urban forestry. I'm happy to send it to I you. I just yeah. just saw it the other day. Okay. Send it to me too. Sure. And obviously one of the questions for us is, I think we should only claim credit for what wouldn't happen anyway. Right? So today there's, I'm making this up, I don't know exactly, but 25 acres, 105 acres already forested. He was going to let those trees grow up, so we shouldn't get credit for those. He was going to keep the golf course, and we might be competing with other people. We wish we could credit for that. But, um. I completely agree with your your assessment if we're doing something deliberately to capture carbon that we count that if it's just happening by accident much less so so I, I think the biggest up I'm sorry you have your hand that box question um, I just wanted to add in something that I think may belong and cross in multiple pathways that isn't here from Lily about trees which has to do with the food product food value of trees and given the high carbon costs of producing say nuts mm -hmm. um, and um, shipping them here and that whole process. And I know it can be difficult in a public shade tree because they food producing trees create messes that people aren't interested, you know, don't want to have to deal with. Uh, but in, in a case like this, where you're considering a reforestation, you know, and it's not gonna bother anyone if you have hickory nuts falling and acorns. And um, so just thinking about you know, where thinking ahead many years, can what is there also the carbon value of saying 
okay, now the public can essentially go and and harvest these. Yep. And these have this this has a value. Yep. Um, so just just across cross purposes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we didn't think of it that way in terms of the city just planting. We did play with for the ag land. Was there somebody, you know, obviously it takes a long time to grow walnuts, grow hickory, but was there a private person or, pri you know, a private entity, mm -hmm. you know, nonprofit, presumably, who'd want to take that on, you know, that we wouldn't have to maintain that process? But it's not worth exploring. I, I think this actually directly relates to what I was going to bring up, which it seems to me the biggest risk in terms of carbon to this whole thing is the ag land. Uh, because the way we do most of our farming in the valley is with, I mean, we till and then we till and then we till. So, I mean, it's just so much tillage that we're just putting yeah. carbon into the air. Like yeah. mm -hmm. So if this is city land and we're saying, here, we're, we're, we're going to give you a permission to farm here, then we should come up with a set of rules that say the only way you're going to farm here is if you farm in a way that actually sequesters carbon. And, you know, in other words, use the language. So, so part of the debate, I mean, obviously you can do organic no-till, but part of the debate is the easiest no-till has more oversights. So organic farmers tend to have a lot of turnover. So. Sure. And that might put you towards uh, uh, orchards, yeah, which can be managed organically and have no tillage because, you know, it's a perennial crop and then you're making, you're growing nuts. And quite frankly, the cover crops and winter kill, I mean, there are a bunch of technologies now such that the yes. old story about no-till is no longer true. Um, but we that that knowledge about it has to get spread to more and more farmers who have to take a risk and buy equipment. A roller crimper is not a yeah. piece of equipment most farmers have, right? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. And so the other challenge the city has is if we're going to do it, you know, plant walnuts or hickories or some sort of permaculture, we can do it. We so it's unique to city property. At least city property, we're getting state and federal grants. We can't grant long-term leases to other people. So you know, if I was planting something that had a 20-year payback, mm -hmm. I might do that. But if I was planting something that only got a five-year license, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. So it may be limited on what our funding sources is. Mm -hmm. Or the city can do it ourselves. I think that the idea of growing food crops is, is really good and very important for sustainability. The more that we can grow here, the less we have to transport food. It's very holistically important. And I, I would think that there would be some nonprofit that would be interested in helping to plant in exchange for being able to harvest uh, later. Um, maybe even. You know, Grow food in Northampton. Northampton. <laughs> 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 you can grow food in Northampton for uh -huh. 10 years. And not this one, but other properties. But this one? Well, there's now new leadership. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we've worked a little bit. Elisa Klein. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we worked a little with Pioneer Valley's Worker Center, who we have another piece of farmland that they're. Is, so this is not a like carbon footprint, but how do we get immigrant farmers who, are, who need land? So yeah, all those things were starting to happen for those 10 acres. Yeah. Um, cool. and, and frankly, one of the things we're looking at is. Can we find a partner, whether it's Grow Food North Hampton or Pioneer Valley Worker Center, who they take it on? So it's yeah. not, you know, the same thing. The only other thing that I'm just, I'm sure that we're on this, but just only planting native species, obviously. Is Except we want to be species natural. that are going to likely thrive yeah. 100 years from now when it's warmer is the challenge. We don't know that it's, if we act appropriately, we may not have that problem. So, so there's some, they're, they're like, you know, we're it's getting warmer. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a whole lot. It's in. getting wetter. Right. It's get it's gonna have periods of dry. Like we can't, we don't want to plant things that like a hundred years from now we can also go, oh my god, why did we plant this? Now they're everywhere, and we can't kill them, right? So yeah. if we're planting a hundred acres, like really looking at, and I've had big discussions with this with apple farmers and we're talking about whether or not we start planting different zones apple trees and the current uh, thought amongst apple growers is that we do not that what we focus on is planting hardier root stocks which will be able to drive down into the soil survive better than, than the weaker new 
some of the weaker root stocks. Um, but that changing the actual trees that we plant may be a terrible idea because the cold hardiness of those apple trees in this instant is is going to be important because we're still going to get these swings of vicious northern cold. Sure. I guess the question is, if we're talking about this particular piece of property, we're mostly talking about reforesting the the property to operate as a forest, not a not a plantation of planted right. trees so much as right. an it's ecosystem that's going to function. No, it's a pretty different principle. Your survival of native uh, trees versus... Uh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, but the point is that you're, you're doing a whole lot less planting and a whole lot more natural, growth. Natural, encouraging of growth, in which case right. lots of natives are going to grow. Right. There that's are right. going to be invasive species there, too. Mm -hmm. Going to have that. That's true. Um, the only other thing on that would be that the that uh, if we're going to be plant the younger stages of growth are going to come up on their own. What are we really looking to accomplish through the the planting? Those that will grow up and turn into a forest on its own. Are we just looking to jump start it? Uh, what's what's the purpose of planting it at all, as opposed right. to letting it right. just naturally form a meadow and then uh, successful. Growth. It's successional growth. Are we trying to, to leapfrog that first couple generations of growth and jump over the head of the white pine that will well, start? Especially or? because we get so much invasive. So, uh -huh. you know, I mean, when I was an undergraduate more years ago, I care to admit, we talk about edges and how valuable edges are. But yeah. when we've done an assessment of all our conservation areas. Uh -huh. We actually have a lot less invasives within our conservation areas, I thought, and a lot more at the edges. Mm -hmm. And so that's the problem. If, if you look at Elwell Island, which has been allowed to grow for the last 80 years, uh -huh. it's still invasive, and the trees are not taking over the meadow. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. It's just so dense in the size. So, so we need to do something to break the size. Okay, cool. Just the time. time yeah, okay. Thank you all. We need a vote to uh, adjourn. Oh, oh. Should we adjourn? Yes. People seem to do it. I know people seem to do it. Yeah, so unless anyone wants to know, we're just adjourning at uh, 5.36. <laughs>